Tachim is talking about the book of Hosea, and they've got they've got a question about the book of Hosea. You might remember the book of Hosea. Um, it has a very memorable beginning, it has a very memorable first little bit where God uh, speaks to Hosea and tells him to marry a prostitute, that Hosea should marry a prostitute, he should have children by her, um, as a metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel, that God and the Jewish people are married, but the Jews have not been faithful in their marriage. They have acted like prostitutes. They have gone and worshipped other gods. They have worshipped the gods of the Canaanites. And so God is using Hosea as a metaphor to, um, to, to, uh, to, you know, to point out just how terrible this is, just how awful this is. So the prophet himself is forced to go and marry prostitute. Now, the rabbis... They, um, they, 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 they find this very problematic. Um, they never come out and say like, oh, that's awful. But they do seem to want to figure out why. Because this is not a metaphor that's unknown to us. Um, you know, the, the, the metaphor of God and the Jewish people being married to each other is, uh, is, is fairly, fairly established, fairly well known. It's one of, the, one of the major metaphors to describe the relationship. And this, this isn't the only place either where we see a conversation about the way the metaphor breaks, the way the metaphor um, can, can sort of collapse in, in accusations of infidelity and that sort of thing. Um, but never before and never again does the prophet who is bringing this message to Israel, is the prophet himself forced to, uh, to engage in something um, quite so uh, unseemly as marrying a prostitute. And so the question the rabbis have is, I, what's going on here? What Basically, they want to know, what did Hosea do that made him deserve this? Because he must have done something, right? He must have, he must have said something or done something that would make him deserve this. Um, and, but but there's, a, there's a problem uh, because uh, the text in Hosea very clearly says that he didn't do or say anything. And that's where we're going to jump in here. Um, I'm going to do a screen share. We'll take a look at, um, at Psachim uh, 87a, and then we'll, we'll get to some of the good stuff further, further down the line. So the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Be'eri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. So you can see here the Talmud doesn't quote the whole thing, but it quotes enough so that you know what it's, uh, what it's talking about. Those are the words in bold. And the full verse is, uh, is given here for you in the translation. Um, and then, uh, so it says in, um, in, 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 in the text here, when the Lord spoke first to Hosea, when the Lord first spoke to Hosea, the first thing he said was go marry a prostitute. So Hosea didn't say anything to God, didn't do anything to God, had not initiated this relationship in any way. And the very first thing that God says is go marry a prostitute. And the rabbis say, well, that's that, that's a problematic reading because why why would God do that to Hosea who didn't who didn't deserve that? Um, and so they say, oh, it must not mean that actually. When it says first, it must mean something different. It must be that there were four rabbi, four prophets rather, who prophesied in the same time, in the same era. Um, and we know that from comparing our text that we've got Hosea, Isaiah, Amos, and Micah, and they all live in the same time period. And so when the text says first, it means that Hosea was the first of those four. He was the first of the four to receive prophecy. And this is not the first interaction between God and Hosea. Hosea chapter one is not the first interaction. In fact, there is an earlier one that the rabbis reconstruct. So this is not from the book of Hosea. The rabbis figured this out. You might say they make it up, but they 
they, they, through, through the Midrashic lens, they say, what must have happened for God to tell Hosea to marry a prostitute? There must be something that Hosea did or said that would make this be a reasonable consequence, because right now it's feeling pretty unreasonable. And so they take a look and they say, okay, so the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Hosea, your sons have sinned. The Jewish people have sinned. And Hosea should have said to God in response, they are your sons. They are your children. They are the children of your beloved ones. They are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Extend your mercy over them. That's a prophet's job. That's the part of the prophet's job that we don't see. Every job has parts that are a little more public and a little more private. Mine certainly does. There are parts of the job that you don't know. There are parts of the job that you don't see. And part of the prophet's job is to argue to God on behalf of the people. The prophet is supposed to be the people's defender. But instead, Hosea says, eh, master of the universe, the entire world is yours. Since Israel has sinned, exchange them for another nation. Okay, you don't like the Jews? Get someone else. You're the one who chose them. Maybe you can choose someone else. <sighs> oh, Hosea. Now, in a sense, this is a reasonable claim, actually. I mean, not every marriage works out. Sometimes you just got to walk away. Sometimes you just got to say, oh, that didn't work. Okay. Try again. But this is where the metaphor actually breaks down. Because the marriage between God and Israel isn't like a Jewish marriage. We, don't, we didn't sign a ketubah with a divorce clause. This, this marriage, this is, this is, we're, we're, we're stuck with each other. And Hosea doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that covenant is eternal. It is forever. That there won't be a trading in for another people. By the way, this text, I can't prove to you that this text is written with any um, modern circumstance in mind, but I strongly suspect that uh, based on the, well, I don't want to get into it, but based on some of the some of the artifacts of the language, this feels rather late as a piece of Talmud. This feels fifth, sixth century, and so I have my suspicion that this is written in response to Christianity which makes this exact claim that God has replaced the Jews with another people, that the Jews were too much trouble, too much sin. They killed their prophets. They killed you-know-who, and therefore they have been replaced. The covenant has been superseded. This was the only claim that Christianity made about Jewish-Christian relations for around 1900 years. Fortunately, there are many Christians today who have a very different understanding of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. We want to give credit to that. Um, but this was, for a very long time, the understanding in the church that um, Hosea is 100% right. They're too, they're too much trouble? Trade them in for another people, which is exactly what God did. But this text is saying, oh, Hosea, no, no, what are you doing here? And we're going to see that God, God, God has an inner monologue here. God thinks to God's self. Hmm. He says, what am I going to do with this old man who doesn't know how to defend the Jewish people, doesn't understand the job of a prophet is to protect the people, to defend the people, to argue on behalf of God and to be the voice of God in front of all of the people and to tell them the unvarnished truth, the naked truth. They don't want to hear that they have fallen short, that they have transgressed, that they have done so many things they shouldn't do. That, but that is only half the job of the prophet. The other half of the job is to defend the people in front of God. And Hosea just doesn't get this. And so 
God comes up with a plan. He says, I am going to tell Hosea to go marry a prostitute and to go have children. The, the text says children of prostitution, um, which I, I, I think is, um, we'll see later, it strongly implies that, uh, that she continues to work as a prostitute um, after the marriage and that Hosea is not certain about uh, whether his children are, are biologically his. And so, um, but this is all a hypothetical. God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell him to marry a prostitute and have children. And then later, I'll say, send her away. And if he does, then I will send away the Jewish people. So God is building a test. And this is a very high stakes test. Hosea is going to marry a prostitute. And if he's able to successfully divorce her, then God will divorce Israel. God will divorce the Jewish people. And so that's what he does. He tells Hosea, take a wife of prostitution. And so it says uh, he did. He went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. And then the rabbis make a dirty joke here that we'll skip over. And then there's a, a conversation about, well, we're going to skip ahead here. All right, so she conceived. She has children. Now, you might remember this from the book of Hosea, if you've studied it, that when they have children, when Hosea and Gomer have children, the, their three children are given very strange names um, that indicate a trouble in the, the human divine re relationship. Uh, it says, she conceived as she bore him a son, and the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For I will visit the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will obliterate the kingdom of the house of Israel. So their firstborn child is named Israel, Jezreel, um, which is the name of a valley in, uh, in the, the north, in, in the land of Israel, um, a, a, site of a site of a famous battle where the, uh, one, one, of the, one of the kings uh, was overthrown and his line was wiped out and, and, and a new king came to power with the blessing of God, but it was a terribly bloody thing. And the rabbis say here that um, God approved of it only because it was supposed to make the situation better in Israel. If it didn't make the situation any better, then it was just bloodshed for no purpose. It's worth noting also here, the word Jezreel or Israel, you can look in the, in the Hebrew, um, it comes from the root Zerah, which means seed or planting seed, uh, which can refer to human children, and it can also refer to planting in the field. So God will plant is, uh, is, is the, or God will sow is probably the best translation of Israel. Then they had another child, a daughter, and God said, name her Lo Ruchama, for I will no more have compassion upon the house of Israel that I should bear them. So Lo Ruchama, without pity, without mercy, Probably the best translation of that. Um, and God is saying, I'm not going to have mercy on Israel anymore. I won't pity them. I won't have any compassion on them anymore. I will judge them strictly on merits of justice. And that's not going to go very well for them. And then they can, uh, she conceived and bore another son. And Hosea, uh, or God rather says to Hosea, call his name Loami, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. So now we're really cutting to the heart of the matter. We've got three children, all of whom have names of curse, essentially, all of whom have names that indicate a rupture in God's marriage to Israel. And you could ask the question, is this rupture um, descriptive? Is this Hosea through his marriage pointing to something that was already there? I think that's the way the text of Hosea is probably meant to be read. But the rabbis actually take it in a different direction. And they say um, that Hosea caused this. Hosea is the problem. He's the one who introduced this rupture in the relationship. 
So it says, after the two sons and one daughter had been born to him, the Holy Blessed One said to Hosea, shouldn't you have learned from the example of your master Moses, who once I spoke with him separated from his wife? You too separate yourself from your wife. Okay, so now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Um, God basically makes up a halakha here that prophets should be separated from their wives, that prophets should divorce their wives. Um, and and it's, it, this, is, this is not the standard uh, prophetic action. Um, but Moses does this in the book of Exodus in preparation for the, um, for the giving of the Torah, which, um, I mean, the, the way you ought to read it probably is that that was, a, that, that, that was a special separate moment of prophecy. That was a higher level of prophecy than we normally get with the rest of the prophets. But God is sort of tricking Hosea here and says, actually, all prophets should be divorced from their wives. And, uh, and you, you should divorce your wife if you're going to continue to be a prophet. Um, and, Hosea, and this is the big test, right? If Hosea does divorce his wife, that God will divorce Israel. God will divorce the Jewish people. Um, but he says, master of the universe, I have sons from her. Probably children is a better translation. And I'm unable to dismiss her or divorce her. So Hosea says, yes, I know that I should divorce her. You said to, prophets ought to. She's not a great wife in the first place, you know, continuing to work as a prostitute, but I love her. And God says, yes, this is the whole point. This is what I've been trying to tell you says the holy one blessed be he rebuked him and said to him just as you whose wife is a prostitute and your children are the children of prostitution and you don't even know if they're yours and despite this you still love her and will not forsake them so too to me are the jewish people who are my children the children of my faithful ones the children of abraham isaac and jacob they are so special to me that they are one of four acquisitions that i acquired in my world and then the text goes on to describe there the whole world belongs to god but there are four things for which god um has a sort of a special uh seal of ownership a special stamp of ownership and they are torah and the holy temple and the jewish people and uh what is uh what is, what is the other one um i missed it <laughs> that's okay that's okay um and, uh, and then, uh, so God yells at him a little bit. And you, Hosea, said, I should replace them with another people? This is, this is shocking. This is remarkable. And Hosea realized he sinned. And he begs forgiveness. He requests God. He says, have compassion on me, for I have spoken ill of the Jewish people. And God replies to him, before you request compassion for yourself, first you should request compassion for the Jewish people, because I have already decreed three harsh decrees on them because of you, because of you, Hosea, the prophet, with your three children. Every time your, one of your children was born, I cursed Israel, and I did it because of you, to teach you a lesson. So don't ask for compassion for you. Ask for compassion for Israel. And then we'll see what happens for you. Now, Hosea is finally maybe learning the job here. He's finally learning how to be a prophet. And Hosea stood and requested compassion for the Jewish people. And God nullified the decrees and turned them into blessing. It says, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea that cannot be measured. And it will... B, that instead of that which was said to them, you are not my people, lo ami, you shall be children of the living God. And the children of Judah and Israel shall be gathered together. I will sow her to me into the land. And I will have compassion upon her that had not received compassion. And I will say to them that were not my people, you are my people. So all three of the children are getting referenced here. I will sow her to me into the land. That's Jezreel. That's Israel. He will sow. And I will have compassion upon her that had not received compassion. That's lo ruchama. And I will say to them that were not my people, you are my people. That's lo ami. All three children of curse have now turned into children of blessing. 
And then this is where this is where it gets real fun. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. So Rabbi Elazar said, even at the time of the anger of the Holy One, blessed be he, he remembers the attribute of compassion. As it is stated in the text we just saw, uh, for I will no more have compassion upon the house of Israel. So to understand that, I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense in English. Even when he's angry, God still remembers compassion. As it is stated for, I will no more have compassion upon the house of Israel. It makes a little more sense in the Hebrew. Because in the Hebrew, it says, Ki lo osif od arahem et beit Israel. Um, probably the best translation that I will not increase any more that I will have compassion upon Israel. So even in anger, God still is referencing that he does, in fact, have compassion upon the Jewish people. And Rabbi Yosef bar Rabbi Hanina said um, that uh, it, 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 it can, comes from the continuation of that verse. Uh, that I will continue to bear them, uh, which really reads in a literal shot understanding of the verse that I won't bear them anymore. Um, but if you look at it literally, he says, I will continue to bear them. Um, and so what's sort of being described here is a, is a hypothetical that won't be the case anymore. Um, Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Chinina says, actually, it will be. Uh, it, it'll, it'll be just fine. It'll, it'll, it'll be just fine here. Um, and then uh, the, text, uh, the text goes on because you have to ask yourself the question here, if this is true, that at the time of God's anger, God remembers compassion. And we have other texts in our tradition that say God's, comp God's compassion lasts basically forever, and God's anger lasts only for the, the briefest of moments. Um, sometimes they say, you know, like one, I think it's like one six thousandth of a second. I can't remember the exact number. Um, but God's, uh, God's, com uh, God's anger is, is, uh, is described in various places as very, very short, very small. Um, and so then the question that any, uh, any, any Jew is going to ask themselves is, okay, well, we have so many references in our texts in our liturgy about the anger of God, about how God gets mad. God is very upset about all the things we're doing. And we also see that there are consequences. And we just saw that every, um, every day in the Passover liturgy, we see for our sins, we were exiled from the land of Israel. We see that over and over again, that we were exiled from the land of Israel and the temple was destroyed because of our sins and because of God's righteous anger in response to our sin. And so the question that this text is going to force us to confront is if God's anger is always suffused with compassion, if God's compassion is always the dominant um, strain. Why were we sent into exile? Why were we scattered? Why was our temple destroyed? And we'll take a look here. Rabbi Elazar said, the Holy One, blessed be he, exiled Israel among the nations only so that Converts would join them. As it is stated, I will sow her to me in the land. It says, does a person sow a seah of grain for any reason other than to bring in several core of grain during the harvest? So too, the exile is to enable converts from the nations to join the Jewish people. So that verse we already saw, I will sow her to me in the land. Uzrati Haliva Aretz, which was the transformation of the curse of Jezreel into a blessing. But we, uh, we see here now that the land isn't actually the land of Israel. Oh, the land is the earth. The land is the whole planet. 
and that the exile isn't a punishment. It is part of a holy task. It is part of a holy duty to go out into the world and to make sure that the world is aware of the God of Israel and the covenant of the Jewish people and that everyone on earth has an opportunity to decide for themselves whether that's something that speaks to them and that the Jewish people are planted in the land like grain. We are scattered like grain and we are planted like seeds. And no one plants one seed with any hope other than to get a whole basket full of grain. And so it is in the world. We are planted with the hope of growth, with the hope of increase, with the hope of conversion. And Rabbi Yochanan reaches the same point in a slightly different way. He said, this idea may be derived from here, and I will have compassion upon her that had not received compassion. The very next verse about lo ruchama, rihamti et lo ruchama, that I will have compassion upon her for whom there is no compassion, which is to say that the people who are judged by God's strictness will be judged instead by the mercy that comes with God's covenant. And perhaps what this verse is really pointing to is the second unwritten part of that verse. And I will say to them that we're not my people, you are my people. The lo ami, I will say, you are my people. Likewise, there are people all over the world who are not currently part of God's people, but they could be, they might be. It says, even those who are initially not my people, i.e. Gentiles, will convert and become part of the Jewish nation. And so Hosea got it completely wrong. But in being completely wrong, he was the tiniest bit right when he said, just trade them for another people. And God says, no, the point isn't to trade them for another people. The point is that the Jewish people, the Jewish covenant are like seeds. Seeds to be scattered into the wind but seeds that will take root and will grow and will transform the entire world.